this year had to be the most special one of all. It was October the 5th when Eddie Robinson became college football's all-time winningest coach, picking up victory number 324 to pass the legendary Paul Bear Bryant of Alabama. At Notre Dame, Jerry Faust became the losingest coach in Irish history. After five seasons, the Faust era at Notre Dame came to a close. Lou Holtz had performed magic at Minnesota, and Notre Dame wasted no time in hiring Holtz as its next coach. TCU's Jim Wacker is a coach who made headlines for a different reason. When seven players confessed to accepting illegal payments from alumni, Wacker kicked all seven players off the team and immediately turned the investigation over to the NCAA. It is ridiculous to stick our head in the sand anymore and say, hey, the problem doesn't exist. And if it's going to be corrected, it's going to be done by the coaches. But there were many bright spots this year in college football, one of which was the resurgence of the service academies. At West Point, Army had its best season in almost two decades. And Air Force was also flying high. The Falcons at one point climbed to number four in the rankings and claimed the Commander-in-Chief trophy. However, the most celebrated trophy in college football is the Heisman. And this year it came down to quarterback Chuck Long of Iowa, who led the Hawkeyes to the Big Ten title, and running back Bo Jackson of Auburn, who rushed for almost 1,800 yards and 17 touchdowns. In the closest vote in the history of this trophy, the winner is, from Auburn University, Bo Jackson. It was a record-breaking season for running back Joe Dudak of Plymouth State. All he did was score 79 career touchdowns, more than any college player ever. 79 was also the lucky number for UCLA's John Lee. That's how many field goals he kicked in setting an NCAA career record. And on his way to making the All-America team, John Lee became an American citizen. All of America was watching on October the 19th when number one Iowa met number two Michigan and it came down to the final play. Rob Holtman is attempting a 29-yarder which would beat Michigan. It's on its way and it's good. The Hawkeyes' joy was short-lived as just two weeks later, Ohio State upset top-ranked Iowa 22-13. Florida moved to the top of the rankings and raised the question, should a team on probation be eligible for a national championship? I think a team that's on probation, whether it's Oklahoma or Florida, should not win a national championship. The records count for teams on probation. The losses certainly count for the teams they beat. Therefore, if they play, they're ranked. The controversy didn't last for long. The next week, Florida fell to arch-rival Georgia, and a new number one emerged, Penn State. Penn State being ranked as one of the top teams in the country, not a surprise ordinarily, but they were coming off a 6-5 record in 1984. And Joe Paterno entered this season with a new determination. You know, he was very determined, more determined than I'd, I've seen him since, you know, the, the previous two years. And so I, I really felt, feel that, that he knew that we had, you know, good days ahead of us. The good days began in the first game of the season against highly ranked Maryland. The Penn State defense forced a turnover with 38 seconds remaining in the game as the Nittany Lions held on for a 20-18 victory. I remember that game saying, hey, boy, they, you know, we ought to feel pretty good about ourselves. In fact, I think I told the squad that I said, hey, now you guys ought to start to think about how good you can be, not just are you good enough to win. How good can you be? You know, I think the Alabama game was a big game as far offensively. And it was a big game, and, and we felt going in that, you know, we had to have a, a good passing day, a good running day, a good combined effort, you know, and I think that, I think we did. And, and fortunately for us, we won the football game. After the Alabama game, I felt if we could, if, if we didn't get careless, we could come down to Notre Dame and Pitt being the best football team we could be, and then it would just let it all hang out, and uh, we would have a good chance for all the marbles. But against Syracuse, Penn State almost slipped. Quarterback John Schaefer tossed a touchdown pass with just 1.53 to play to pull the game out for the Nittany Lions. Two weeks later, Boston College almost pulled off an upset. But defensive tackle Mike Russo's interception for a touchdown capped a 16-12 comeback win. After a victory over Cincinnati, only Notre Dame and Pittsburgh remained for Lions. If we had those te two teams left at the end of the season, you know, we'd be ready for them. And there was no, no one in the world that needed to get us up for those games because we remembered the, the embarrassment that we felt after the, after the games last year. There would be no embarrassment this season, only sweet revenge. The Lions crushed Notre Dame 36-6. to 6. 
and then went on to whip arch rival Pittsburgh 31 to nothing to complete the regular season undefeated, untied, and ranked number one in the country. We're not a team of all Americans. We don't have the names. We don't have the Heisman Trophy candidates, but we have an awful lot of good people. The final hurdle for Penn State takes place the night of January 1st in the Orange Bowl against third-ranked Oklahoma. At stake, the national championship. If we win, you know that you'll be the best. And we'll be 12-0, and nobody can say that they, that they were undefeated. And at that moment, we'll realize if we're fortunate enough to win that football game, that we'll be the best. In 1985, England's Steve Cram set new world marks in the 1500 meters, the mile, and the 2000 meter events, all within the span of 19 days. That's a world record for world records. Come on along, I'll take you to the lullaby of Broadway. Hippery and Valley Who. The lullaby of Broadway. And in the center of it all, Stay at the Milford Plaza Hotel with cocktail dinner and breakfast for $43 per person. Discover why we are the lullaby of Broadway. The Milford Plaza is the lullaby of all Broadway. Introducing an incredible advance in Gillette shaving smoothness, new Atra Plus. The Plus is this unique white strip that releases lubricants as you shave. You never felt anything smoother. New Atra Plus by Gillette, the essence of shaving. Now, another way to spell relief, use sodium-free Rolaids. Like regular Rolaids, it consumes all the acid required to bring millions 100% relief. Plus, it's rich in calcium. Regular Rolaids and use sodium-free Rolaids for 100% relief. We're not a company. But we'll give you a chance to work where there's always a challenge. We'll give you opportunities to learn, to develop, to perfect skills that you thought were beyond your reach. We'll help you build a career, a career that can reward you for the rest of your life. We're not a company. We're your country. We're the Army. The Navy. The Air Force. The Marines. We're the Armed Forces. It's a great place to start. For the Washington Redskins, it's a must-win situation. Coverage begins with the NFL Today, next on CBS Sports. Nineteen eighty-five was many things, but it was not an Olympic year. It was the year after. Some of the stars from Sarajevo and Los Angeles came back down to Earth, while still others rocketed into even higher orbits and a cherubic high-flying gymnast named Mary Lou proved that the sky is the limit. One year later, the faces are still familiar. They were America's class of 1984. Bill Johnson became the first American ever to win a World Cup downhill, conquering the grueling Lauberhorn at Bengen, Switzerland. That would lead to a gold medal in Sarajevo, Yugoslavia. And Johnson now thought he knew what to expect in 1985. Uh, millions. We're talking millions. The real-life version of Hollywood's downhill racer saw his own life become a movie going for the gold. His wind tunnel workouts and training were reaching a peak, and the old bravado was back with style. My kind of snowfall, and if I don't win today, there's something wrong with me. In 1985, there was plenty wrong with Johnson's performances. For downhill Billy, it was a dismal year. In a way, he was a victim of his own success. His 1984 victories placed him in the first draw, and he learned a very tough lesson. What I learned this year was uh, there's a lot more luck involved coming from the first group than there is, say, from the second group, where conditions are more consistent. And it's something that I'm just going to have to learn how to deal with because coming from the first group I don't think I'll be able to win as many. In Los Angeles summer games the fastest man was Carl Lewis. He tied Jesse Owens mark of four gold medals but despite his indisputable superiority within the confines of the Coliseum Lewis track record with the press was spotty and in 1985 he looked to leave that problem behind. Uh, out of the blocks Brady gets a great start he so is Ben Johnson here comes Carl Lewis and Lewis 
continued to compete and win in 1985, but on a track in Los Angeles, he sustained a hamstring pull that hampered his effectiveness. This is the first time I had a major injury, and that set me back somewhat, but in a way it didn't, it just kind of pushed me forward a little bit because I needed a rest. So Lewis used his time off to pursue his interests in singing, dancing, and acting. The better he communicates, the more marketable he'll be. I, I did do one commercial in Japan, which probably paid more than uh, most other people's two and three commercials put together. Overall, 1985 has been good to Lewis. He owns the year's best marks in the 100 meters and long jump, and he's controlling his life. What I think is important is to keep competing, to try and study, and to try and be the best actor, singer, performer, athlete that I can possibly be, not necessarily just make direct money. Willie Banks. He was a pre-Olympic favorite for a medal who came up empty in L.A. But in 1985, he atoned, becoming the male track and field athlete of the year and setting the world record in the triple jump. For Banks, it was a leap of faith. Well, I always thought I could do it. And all of a sudden, something hit me. It's like, I don't know what it was. And I, I kind of looked inward. And I could see myself breaking the world record. It was a vision. I, I was shocked. I'd never had anything like that happen to me before. I knew I was going to do it. There was no problem. I didn't even worry. Mary Decker Slaney. She was 1985's female track and field athlete of the year. And hers, too, was a comeback drama. All through 85, she was haunted by memories, hounded by media, and hated by peers. I feel like I have any reason to apologize. If anyone should do any apologizing, I think it should be Wysocki for, for uh, talking about things she doesn't have any information about. Slaney would answer in the way she knew best, letting her legs do the talking as they pounded out a world's record in the mile. But then, just when it looked like she would shatter another mark, disaster, shades of L.A. Back, but she is in obvious pain and she's pulled off the infield as Richburg and Christina Boxer go by and she's appears to be holding her right calf. Once healed, Slaney remained undefeated. She also settled her score with Zola Budd, easily outpacing the teenager in the 3,000 meters. All told, Slaney enjoyed her best season. Many detected a newfound maturity. And looking ahead, the new year will bring a baby. Performance-wise, just the consistency and the quality of the performances this past year, I think this is my, has been my best season to date. Hello, Mary Lou. The personality of the Olympics was Mary Lou Rett. 1985 was a year of non-stop appearances before adoring crowds. She was the envy of every teenager and politician in the land. It was a new life. So hello, Mary Lou, goodbye, the biggest change in me would be I'm becoming a businesswoman, you know? I'm starting to learn the ropes, I guess you could say. Well, Mary Lou plugged away all year, providing nutritional counseling about what the big boys eat and assaulting us for batteries. Through it all, she never forgot what vaulted her to fame and fortune. Remember, you only get out of it what you put into it. And so every day, she put in a good five hours at the gym, staying sharp under the tutelage of her mentor, Bella Caroli. But performing would never be the same. I went into 1985 American Cup as kind of the, the older gymnast and people were looking at me a different way. There was a huge, huge, bigger pressure on me there. You know, oh, she's Olympic champion, she should win. And that's precisely what she set out to do. such a big, big success for me. I'm the only one that has ever done that three consecutive years in a row. Nadia didn't even do that. <laughs> that was a big thing for me.
But the capper in a year of recognition was induction as the youngest ever member in the Olympic Hall of Fame. Just being in the 1984 games was